Brian Keating is going to be speaking about Going Wild, where are the planet's best wilderness locations today. He is the Honorary Conservation Advisor, Calgary Zoo Adjunct Professor, Adjunct Assistant Professor of Anthropology at the University of Calgary. He previously held the position Head of Conservation Outreach at the zoo, which enabled him to raise money and then spend it on environmental projects around the world. He's been leading groups on nature-based travel for three decades, exploring some of the best wildlife, wildlife areas on the planet. He's a weekly guest on both Calgary and Edmonton CBC Radio, and I know many of you are here because you have heard him on the radio. As you can tell, it took us a year to get him here. He's in high demand as an international speaker, presenting at some 50 events a year. His talks have proven themselves the highlight of many conferences and special events. Brian has also written five children's books celebrating nature. He's a pilot, a naturalist, a scuba diver, a mountaineer. With, together with his wife, Dee, who is a physician and keen naturalist, um, they go on their adventures. Together, no, together, they have explored nearly 50 countries on all seven continents in the last quarter century. Let's all welcome Brian Keating. I was also born in Medicine Hat. How about that, eh? So when I was driving down from Calgary today, I felt, I felt like I was coming home. I had my window down, and when I smelled that cow poop out there, I thought, boy, this is, this is making my blood boil. I love this place. Honestly, it's, it's a pleasure to be here and, uh, and wonderful to be able to address you today. I've, I've created a presentation to talk about uh, uh, wild places today. And, and I, I'm going to start afar, then I'm going to bring it home to our own Lethbridge backyard, our foothills. Uh, you know, when we think of uh, protected areas, we think of national parks. Uh, that's, that's what I grew up with. And, and the places that I've explored on over 50 trips, I've quit counting how many trips I've done to Africa since 1983. Africa is really my home away from home. It was always my focus has been on exploring the national parks there. And then I, I got involved in doing some volunteer work in West Africa, and it showed me that it's not just the national parks where these wild areas are preserved. There's a, there's, there's a, a country that I've been exploring now for the last couple of years, you may have heard of it, Ethiopia. And when you think of Ethiopia, what do you think of? You think of people in trouble, you think of drought, you think of starvation, and that's because what, that's what the media has told us. And, and Tourism is not a big thing in Ethiopia, but it's got some unbelievably beautiful wild locations, and that's what drew me to that country. I've always been a mountain boy. I've always enjoyed the mountains. I've always enjoyed climbing those mountains, exploring, hiking, tenting, camping, canoeing, as much as I've enjoyed exploring the short grass prairies. I've, I've virtually canoed every single canoeable stretch south of Red Deer all the way to the Saskatchewan border. Milk River used to be my annual migration every spring when I would uh, canoe parts of that area. Uh, but, you know, this whole business of wildlife uh, conservation is something that's dominated my mind for a long, long time. I, I was born in Medicine Hat, but I grew up out east in New York. I, I spent 11 years there from age six onward, uh, left just before I would have been drafted to the Vietnam War, uh, came back to Canada, very happy to be back in this country. Uh, but what, what showed me out there is, is that even these small little areas can preserve good wildlife. I grew up next to a 20-acre forest, and that's where, that's where I spent a lot of my childhood. Uh, you know, there's a, there was an, an article on the front page of the Globe and Mail about 15, 18 years ago, and I remember it well. I wish I clipped it out, but I didn't. It, it said that people my age, I'm 59, when I was a kid, People my age spent 80% of their time, 80% of their spare time outdoors messing around in the woods, in the prairies, in the coolies, down by the slough. 80% of their spare time messing around. And uh, you know what that statistic is today with kids? How much? 8%, it's actually 5%. And I don't know about you, but that makes me very nervous. Who's going to, if you don't grow up with that, that joy of exploring the wild areas, you know, we all know what, what the, the, the wild smells like, what it feels like. We know what meadowlarks call like. But if you, if you grow up indoors 
plugged in, tuned in, you're tuned out to this natural world. And where's that going to leave people? What's, what is that going to do? I suspect it's going to leave people with an empty space. Uh, I, I can't even imagine what my life would be like if I didn't develop an interest in birds at age 12. And <laughs> when I was 12 years of age, I got my first pair of binoculars. I spent all kinds of time in the woods. Uh, I, m Mom would kick me out after I'd come home from school. I thought she didn't love me. <laughs> But I took my binoculars, I went over to the woods, and I, I learned how to bird watch. Unfortunately, somebody in high school learned that I was a bird watcher, and I had to live with the name Birdman for the rest of my high school years. But that interest has now taken me around the world. And, uh, and all of these trips to Africa has proven to me that there are not just national parks that are there to keep these areas wild, but there's something called sacred forests. And it was in Ethiopia that I first learned about this. Ethiopia is a Christian Orthodox landscape in a Muslim background. But this Christian Orthodox belief brought with them the desire to set up churches. And around these churches were preserved forests. Many of those forests are now the only wilderness areas in Ethiopia. The good news about them is there are 35,000 of them. You know, if, if I don't really care what religion you are, uh, but what I do care about is wildlife preservation. And wildlife preservation, if it's done through the eyes of God, that's okay. Because God deems that areas must be preserved for intrinsic value. And what do we do today with nature? We buy it and we sell it. You know, we, we have national parks, which because we're a rich country, we, can, we, we have very nicely set aside areas, but really, from a representative perspective, they only, they only satisfy a very small need of total percentage areas that are designated as wilderness locations. Amazingly, the sacred forests of the world account for something like 15% of the globe's landscape. 15% of the globe's landscape is set aside for reasons other than cash value. In other words, they're set aside for intrinsic purposes. And I've been blown away with my exploration of Ethiopia. And I'm going to take you there right now in a short video just to give you an idea of the kind of, of uh, landscape this, this place represents. Well, I arrived there, yes, in the rainy season. Uh, and, uh, but we, we, we realized that Ethiopia is primarily highland with covered either in forest or highland vegetation. The bird life is incredible uh, and it's got a specialized form of wildlife. No, there are no elephants and the chances of seeing lions are very slim, but there are fabulous forests with colobus monkeys with their unique coloration. Uh, there's a vervet monkey uh, derivative called a, 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 a uh, well, it's, it's a small monkey that uh, exists in some of the parks. In the highlands, there's these uh, f uh, flowers called red hot pokers with a backdrop of kudu-like antelope that are only found in Ethiopia called the Mountain Niala. We hiked for six days up in the Simeon Mountains, and this is the kind of landscape we were in for six days. And we, we were there with the objective to see this. This is the Walia Ibex. It's, it's probably the, one of the rarest uh, Ibex in the world. There's only a few hundred of them left. We were there right in the beginning of September, which is like Friday night in Lethbridge uh, around the high school. Uh, the testosterone was bursting out their ears. The males were so involved in, in showing off to each other that we were able to approach incredibly close. We saw some wonderful battles. But primarily, the reason why I wanted to go here was to see this type of baboon. It's called the gelata baboon. And all day long, it sits on its bum and shuffles along. It's a specialized form of locomotion only known with the gelata. They also call them the lion baboon, and you can see why. But they travel around in herds. They basically take the position of the wildebeest of the Serengeti. But there's no antelope up here, so they cut the grass. And they've got specialized fingers. You can see how close my wife is. We would let these groups uh, envelop us. We would see them slowly working their way towards us. And we would just sit and wait there. My wife is pretending to eat grass to calm them down. And they came right up to her to have a look. And these, je these baboons are called gramnivores. 99% of what they eat are grass seeds, grass roots, and grass blades. So they perform the primary uh, 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 
consumer of the vegetation. This is called a lip flip. Look at that. If you're at a business meeting in Lethbridge and somebody does this across the table from you, look out. That's basically a way of one male saying to another, don't even think about coming near me because my teeth are big and I'll rip your face off. But look at how gorgeous those baboons are. They're also called the bleeding heart baboon because of that pink spot on the chest. Unique to Ethiopia, found only in Ethiopia. Then down in the southern mountains, and I crossed this landscape by horseback last year. We did 160 kilometers, uh, a vertical mile above sea level. It's the place of the Ethiopian wolf, which used to be called the Ethiopian fox, but DNA has indicated that it's is actually, it is actually a derivative of the European gray wolf. And we spent uh, uh, several days on this first trip down there. We actually saw the wolves catching and eating rodents. These wolves don't get into trouble with the farmers because they eat small rodents. There's 18 species of rodents there, including the giant mole rat, which is about the size of a guinea pig. And we actually watched them feeding on them. You can see the white follow me signals on the back of the Ethiopian wolf. So that that, that is the kind of quality of the landscapes that are there. Uh, some of these areas have been set aside as parks. That particular area is a park because of its designated importance as a water catchment area. So now, instead of preserving areas just for the wildlife, uh, we're realizing that water is one of the most valuable resources we've got. And if anybody knows that, the people, people of southern Alberta know that. And they're starting to set aside areas uh, for water catchment. In fact, Ethiopia is considered to be the water tower of Africa. About five or six major rivers in that part of Africa emanate from those Ethiopian highlands. So if you go at the right time of the year, it's a botanical wonderland a unique birding opportunity, and for a limited number of very highly specialized animals, it's the only place in the world you see them. So quite a special place. So how did I first learn about these sacred groves? Well, years ago, about 20 years ago, my wife and I felt like Africa had given us so much, it's time for us to give something back to Africa. So we went into, Eth into West Africa upon the invitation of a zoological society in Ghana, in Accra. And this society was in disarray, as so many poor countries have uh, when they have zoos. They're often in difficult situations. Uh, I set up the first board of directors. I set up a program for funding. The long and the short of it was the two months that I was there, I met all the movers and shakers in the environmental world. So I came home, six months or eight months passed, and uh, lo and behold, uh, a, 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 a one of the fellows that I met down in, uh, in that part of the world called me up, and he said that he wanted to uh, have the Calgary Zoo get involved in the Wachau Hippo Sanctuary. So this sanctuary, located in northern Ghana, was just an idea when he first phoned me. And he asked if we would submit, or if we could come up with the funds to send a team of biologists in to assess whether or not this particular area was worthy of making into a park, a community park. What had been discovered there is a small population of hippos. Now in East Africa, Southern Africa, hippos are in good numbers. Their numbers are dropping, but they're still in good numbers. In West Africa, hippos are almost extinct because they're big mammals, they come out at night, they mow the grass, they're herbivores, and sometimes grass, well, if you think about it, corn is a type of grass, and hippos would sometimes get into the cornfields, which are their, their, their staple, uh, and <coughs> you can imagine a bunch of hippos in your cornfield is not good for productivity. So uh, they, they were, at, they were at, at loggerheads as to what to do with these hippos, but the hippos had a designation as being sacred. What happened was, about 400 years ago, there was human hunters in the area hunting for humans to, tell, to sell to the Portuguese, the Spaniards, the Brits, and the French that each took their turn getting slaves from West Africa off the coast. So what they would do is build castles on the coast where they would store the slaves. They would send in natives that they had befriended to go and hunt the slaves. The people of Wachau heard through the grapevine that they were about to be uh, invaded. And, th and stolen. They ran down to the river. When they ran down to the river, they knew about an island in the river that was thick with vegetation. When they got down to the river, there was a bunch of paving stones. They hopped from paving stone to paving stone. They got into the forest. There was a trail there behind them. They looked behind. Apparently, according to legend, the bushes closed in. Those paving stones, after they ran, submerged. Guess what they were? 
Exactly. So the legend was, now you know, you and I with our scientific minds say, oh, pfft. but you know what? I don't care. If the hippos are the reason why the hippo population survived because the land priest, which is sort of like our environment minister with power, he said, nobody's to kill those hippos. Nobody's to kill those hippos, so those hippos survived 400 years. And so that's why the hippos still exist there. So we set up a park with the local people, and this is how that story unfolded. We uh, went in, of course, hippos are a primary consumer. They, they go out and feed on grass at night. They're a multi-ton animal. They've got a mouth as big as a suitcase. They're shaped like a spalumbo sausage with legs. Uh, they are not the most uh, appealing animal to many, but they are a children's storybook animal. And, uh, and they come back into the water and spend the, wa the day in the water. Here, look at that. Look at how they can run like a racehorse. You know, even with all that weight. And watch how this hippo enters the water. It comes up to the sandy riverbank, and then with its body weight, it collapses the riverbank. Watch this. Doof. And then he pulls that big tummy. And what do hippos do in water all day long? Well, they sleep, but they also poop. And all of that defecation inoculates the water with nutrients that feeds the invertebrates, that feeds the fish, that feeds the people. Without hippos, you lose your fisheries. And that's been proven time and time again. So we decided this area is worthy of our investment through the money that I raised way back then when I worked with the Calgary Zoo. We built this tourist lodge, which you too can stay at for $7 a night. But whatever you do, hang your underwear high or that goat will eat it. Trust me, I know. So in the daytime, we would have our, our meals uh, in that enclosed area where there was a screen to keep the, any, any bugs out. The local people are the Lobi people. It was the first time I had ever met the Lobi people. They live in houses that look like they come right out of a Dr. Seuss book. It looks like a toothpaste mud being squeezed out of a toothpaste tube. As the family grows, the compound grows. The whole extended family lives here. So old folks don't go to old folks' homes and kids don't go to daycare. Everybody lives together. Parents, cousins, aunts, uncles, grandparents parents and kids. And as that population grows, so does the compound. Around the compound is all the wheat and grain that they grow and the corn, and they store them in bins like that. And of course, just like in our society, the epicenter of tomorrow are the kids. And I met these kids. Their dad was not at home, but the kid couldn't speak their language, of course, but he went and got his father's xylophone, a homemade xylophone, and uh, he brought it out and played up a tune for me. And, uh, and the reason why we entered this area was because of this fabulous habitat where the hippos live. This area that has never been cut because the land priest said we will never cut those trees. They saved our people, the hippos saved our people, hence the trees and the hippos are still there. So a 40 kilometer stretch was designated as park. People moved back voluntarily with the help uh, financially of money that we raised here in Alberta. And now the park has this rim of forest along the edges that's filled with monkeys and birds and the water contains the hippo population. Now the way we established trust was by drilling water wells and I'll let this uh, take over here. Very strange to think of a zoo drilling water holes and building schools but we know that if conservation is going to work we have to pay attention to the people that live in the area. Well, and that's really the story. We built seven water wells. We dug seven. There's 14 villages in the area where the Wachau Hippo Sanctuary exists. These people had never drunk clean water before. The water that's located in the river is laden with all kinds of parasites, and it's dirty. Now they have clean water that we could drink, even with our tender pink Alberta stomachs. We could drink it without getting sick. And, and, uh, and immediately, the health of the community started to get better. Uh, then my brother happened to be in the green energy energy industry and through a, a vote around the Christmas dinner table where my nieces and nephews were involved, they voted that my brother's company should put some money into Wachow. So we built uh, 550 energy sources. This is my niece. She came along to open up one of them. Look at that. I told her she had to eat everything. 
So we built uh, 550 for the 550 compounds in the 14 villages within the Wichau Hippo Sanctuary. We built these pole systems with, with solar panels on to charge a battery to light uh, an, an LED lights. So the LED lights and the solar panel will last forever. The batteries, this project is now eight years old. The batteries are just starting to give out now, which we expected, but we sourced them locally so they don't have to, pen to depend upon the first world to get those batteries replaced when they finally go. And it's a lot cheaper using a battery every eight years than it is to burn kerosene. It's a lot healthier, and batteries don't burn babies like kerosene does. So the, the spin-off of this has been the reports that we've been getting back from the teachers. Kids' grades are improving because now they have light to read their books by. And, uh, and lovely stories of children found on, the, gr on the, the ground in the morning fast asleep next to their readers. Uh, and we've even developed a system to get some of these kids off into uh, further education. So then somebody much smarter than me asked, where do you go to school, young lady? And this little girl looked up with her big brown eyes and said, Madame, I don't go to school because I have no school to go to. So we realized we had to start building schools. So we built two now. And the first, and this is the celebration, a mixture of the celebration of both uh, events when we opened up the, the, the schools. The uh, xylophones came out. These are handmade xylophone built out of hardwoods from the forest and gourds on the underside. The children were dancing for us. Various age groups came out. It was a huge celebration. We expected with the first school, we expected 65 children to be enrolled the first day that we opened it we had 205 show up so we realized that there was a huge need and of course what we want to do is get these kids educated so that they can eventually come back and uh, and run the park and so that's ultimately the uh, the final objective now the first school that we built was named after the woman that started the school and uh, we realized that uh, that uh, we, the teachers often leave these remote areas because of lousy housing. So we raised enough money to build some very nice houses for the teachers too. It was very easy to do. Our money, our dollar goes a long way in this part of the world. Uh, so, so then we, we uh, opened up the schools. This is the first opening. There's our uh, 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 zoo director of, of several years ago opening up the first zoo or the first school. We realized a school can't all be about learning. It's got to be a little bit about play too. So soccer, of course, is is the international game and we made up some soccer uniforms we had them sewn locally with local materials uh, sewn by a local person so the money would stay within the community uh, with zoo colors of course and uh, and then we gave the boys soccer balls the girls got volleyball nets because the girls don't play soccer and it was a huge celebration they then unfortunately made the decision to challenge us foreigners to a game of soccer and I'm telling you I am uh, I, I am Canadian and for a good reason, I like it cold. It feels good when it gets to negative 10. This was one of the hottest games I've ever played. And let me tell you, I don't even want to tell you what score we got, uh, but they beat us significantly. But here's the celebration level. So very, very exciting. Now to finish off, I want to take us, uh, I want to take you to uh, an idea that I came across a little while ago. So we've been now talking about this business of of, uh, of protected areas being national parks, and, and now that's uh, turned into sacred areas, so areas that have been set aside for sacred reasons, and the Hippo Sanctuary is one example of about 100 in Ghana, and of course in Ethiopia it takes it to the extreme with 35,000. In India there's about 16,000, in the Himalaya another 100, and there's hundreds and hundreds in China. So there are these areas that are designated as sacred forests. Of course, the central nucleus of what makes a sacred forest is the shrine that's there. Now, we don't have any designated sacred forests like that in Canada, but we do have some remarkable land uh, right at our footstep, and that is this, this interface between the Rocky Mountains and the prairies. It's the foothills. It's an area that is still the way it was 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 1,000 years ago. It's an area that still has, and I'm talking about the landscape from just south of Calgary all the way down to the border, right butting up against Waterton National Park. This is your backyard, our short grass prairie. It is less than one half of 1% of all of the original short grass prairie that existed, and yet that one half of 1% is one of the most critical components of our Alberta backyard. It contains 
all of the wildlife that lived there uh, uh, hundreds of years ago, except for the large numbers of bison. But it is still an intact ecosystem. And I want to leave with just this one last comment about, uh, about people like Charlie Russell who uh, I heard about, read about, and finally met. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, he, it's, it's people like Charlie Russell and his father, famous ranchers that were really conservation-minded. And, and they started to see something appalling happening in the foothills uh, in the 1990s. Areas were being cut up and turned into subdivisions of Calgary. And that was very scary for these locals to see. They realized that this brilliant landscape that contained so much, much was going to be basically a place where you could go down to the corner store and get a Starbucks. And that's not very good for our Alberta backyard. And so uh, last September, I was taken on a tour down into uh, the, some of these lands that I call sacred lands. And I think we should learn to view these landscapes, these wilderness backyards that are still working. There's still cattle there, but cattle have replaced the bison, which can never return, obviously, in their original numbers. So it's, but it's a functioning ecosystem where grizzly bears bleed out of the mountains into the prairies, where wolves walk up and down. And I know there's conflicts, but that's tough. At least they're still there. And I think we have to celebrate that. We've got to consider these areas as sacred. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is my story for you today. Thank you very much.